What's going on guys? This is Chandler Smith and it is the season to save money on taxes. <laughs> and so in this video, I'm gonna share with you a couple questions that you need to ask yourself before ever using any tax strategies. I'm gonna share with you the good ones and the bad ones and the ones you should definitely avoid because you're either being manipulated or you could end up in jail. So after we go through all of that at the end, I'm also gonna share with you some of the strategies that I have used to avoid taxes the right way. So with all of that being said, let's jump into it. All right, guys, if you're new to the channel, my name's Chandler Smith, and I've been investing in real estate for the last eight years. I currently own over $13 million of real estate, and I run a sales organization where unfortunately that puts me in a place where I have had to pay a lot of taxes. Now, I know a lot of people aren't in the same situation I'm in. However, I also know that I was in your situation regardless of what it is because I started making not very much money and over the years I've been able to make more and more. And so in this video, my goal is to help you to determine which tax strategies are going to be best for you. And in order to do this, I can't cover every tax strategy and I wanna make sure that it is made very clear that I'm not an accountant, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not someone that you should personally listen to my advice without talking to one of the two or both of those people. So take it for what it's worth, but I'm gonna dive into a couple rules that I live by before using any tax strategy. And then as you stick around to the end of the video, I'm gonna share with you some of the tax strategies that I have used that have helped me to avoid a lot of tax. So we're gonna jump right into the rules, or I guess you could say the questions I ask myself before ever using a new tax strategy. So the first question you need to ask yourself is does it sound too good to be true? And if so, why? Now you're gonna have so many people come to you and say, look, this can get you out of a ton of tax. And they're right, it can. When you do up your taxes, you can literally get yourself out of as much tax as you want. However, that doesn't mean that it's legal or that it won't come back to bite you in the future. So ask yourself, does this sound too good to be true? And if it does, you need to dive in deeper. There are some tax strategies that I use that do sound too good to be true. However, once you research them further, you come to find that it's really just the government incentivizing you to act in a certain way, and it really isn't that good to be true. The majority of the time, you'll come to find that anytime you avoid taxes, you're not necessarily avoiding them, you're just finding a way to kick them down the road. Now, that isn't always true. However, if that's not true, a lot of times you're kind of getting into an area where you're either spending money that you didn't have to spend just to save on taxes, or you're potentially doing something sketchy. Now that's not always true, but that's why you need to start by asking yourself, does it sound too good to be true? Question number two that you should ask yourself is, does it actually save me money? Or am I just spending more money than I'm saving? So number two, does it actually save me money? Number three is how will it affect me negatively in the future? A lot of people jump into some strategy, but they don't think three, five, 10 years in the future to say, hey, is this going to mess me up down the line? The last question you should ask yourself is how much has it been used successfully and how much has it been through an audit? successfully. And these are things that you should dive into. And again, if there's not information on that, it's probably something I would be very careful jumping into. So if you follow these four steps when determining which tax strategies are right for you, I've come to find that asking these questions and really digging into the answers has helped me to fall on some tax strategies that are advantageous to me, but are also safe. Now, I've talked about these four rules, but the number one rule when doing taxes is make sure that you never do something that is going to jeopardize your freedom. I've seen a lot of very successful people do dumb stuff because they're trying to save a buck and then they get audited and they end up in jail. Now, this is an extreme. You should never even get close to that point, but make sure you keep that in mind when you're saying, hey, I could save $50,000 in taxes this year, but it might land me in jail. Don't do that. Don't do that with anything in your business. You always wanna lean on the side of being conservative and you can still push it. All right, you can still find tax strategies that are going to save you money, but I'm telling you right now, your integrity and your freedom is not worth saving a little bit of money on taxes. And when I say you can push it, I mean there are strategies that are going to help you 
to kick taxes down the road so you don't have to pay them right now, but they are legal, they are fair, and they're never going to land you in a place where you or your family or your freedom are jeopardized. And I think so often people forget that because they're trying to save money, whether it's in taxes or business or anything else, don't mess around with that crap. Your freedom and your family and what you have, what you've created to get in the point where you're trying to avoid taxes it's not worth jeopardizing those things. So again, please, I'm begging you, be conservative and be smart. Now let's jump into a couple different tax strategies that a lot of people will come to me and say, Chandler, what are your thoughts on this? And I'm gonna tell you my thoughts. Again, I'm not an accountant, I'm not a lawyer, but hopefully this helps you get to a place where you can look at multiple tax strategies and say, all right, this sounds good. This is something I might pursue. This is something that I won't. The first one that I always have people come to me with is Chandler, should I write this off? Whether it's a car, a computer, something else for my business, something stupid that they think they can get away with writing off as a business expense, which again, that's the sketchy stuff I would stay away from. But all of these things that people come to me and say, Chandler, I could buy a new computer, I could get this phone, I could get this car, I could get this you know, entertainment system for my house that I'll use kind of as a business thing. All of these are things that you need to step back and ask yourself, first of all, if you get audited, is it actually for your business? And this is something you can go through with your accountant because they're going to know what is legitimate for your business and how much you use it compared to what is not. But that's the first thing that you should ask yourself. The second thing you should ask yourself is, am I losing money to try and save money on taxes? I'll have people that'll come to me and say, Chandler, I'm at the 24% tax bracket. I found this incredible computer system. It comes with surround sound, all this crazy stuff. It's five grand and my accountant has told me that if I put that in my office and I use it for business, I can write off the entire thing. That's an incredible write-off. Should I do it? And my question is, well, number one, do you need that? Is that something that's actually going to push your business forward? If you want it and you're going to use it for your business, maybe that's another question, but do you need it and do you want it? Because they're thinking, oh, I get a $5,000 write-off. Well, here's the deal. That isn't $5,000 less you get to pay in taxes. That's $5,000 less that you don't have to count as income. So if you're paying a 24% in taxes and you spend $5,000, only 24% of that $5,000 would have gone to taxes. The rest could have just stayed in your bank and been used for something else. So you've got to ask yourself with any write-off, is it something that I need and that I'm actually going to use? Because if you're spending a dollar to save 25 cents and that dollar isn't something that you need or you're actually gonna use, that doesn't make any sense. If you're doing it just out of spite towards the government, I mean, good for you, go for it. Blow money on crap that you don't need to save money in taxes, but the reality is they're gonna get that money from somewhere, whether it's printing more money <laughs> or taxing somebody else higher. So it's just not worth spending money on something you're not going to use to try and save a little bit on taxes. The next one I have a lot of questions on is Chandler, should I invest in an IRA? And my question is, well, what are you going to actually invest in? Like, yeah, you're using an IRA, but what's that going to go to? And they say, oh, some random investment that he said could get me a three to 5% return. And so my question again is, all right, if you're gonna spend $5,000 to save 25% in taxes, for right now, again, just to push those taxes down the road and lock up that $5,000 for maybe a three to 5% return in something that you know nothing about and also put that money in a place where you can't access it until you're 60 or 65 or whenever your IRA allows you to then get that money. And if you take it out sooner, not only do you have to pay the taxes, but you have to pay a penalty. When someone comes to me, my first question is going to be, well, here's the deal. Can you get a higher return than the 24% you're gonna pay in taxes once and then the three to 5% you're gonna make every year if you make that because you have no idea about this investment? And their answer is, well, I wanted to buy real estate. I thought I could get you know, 20% in cash flow and appreciation and principal pay down and all that other stuff. And so my mind goes, well, why are you trying to avoid the taxes if you could get a higher return on that money and keep it liquid. Now, of course, you can use an IRA to invest in real estate, but again, that money's locked up. And so in my opinion, if you're young, you're 20, 25, 30 years old, and you're really wanting to get ahead, 
Why push that money down the road? Because when you pull it out, you're still gonna have to pay taxes on it. The only difference is that hopefully when you're 60, 65, you're a millionaire and you're making tons of money from your passive income and you're gonna end up having to pay way more tax down the road because in my opinion, taxes aren't going down, they're only going up. So for me, it's like, why not just pay the tax, invest the money, start getting a higher return in an investment that you can keep liquid and you can sell and you can do whatever you want without paying a penalty to get access to that money. So these are the questions you have to ask yourself. You need to look at your personal strategy and say, what am I trying to get out of this? How will it affect me in the future? Am I actually saving money or am I losing money because I don't have access to that money, it's not liquid, and I'm gonna have to pay taxes on it down the road anyways. Now again, I'm sure there are some people watching this video saying, no, you've got to invest in the IRA, it'll keep that money safe, you won't be able to touch it, it's going to get a consistent return, it'll keep you from blowing it. A lot of those things are good arguments, and they're right. You're gonna to have to pay less taxes now, but again, you're locking up $5,000 to save one. Like for me, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, especially if I could take the remaining 4,000 and go and make some killer money with it and a huge return forever in an investment like real estate where I know how to push tax down the road but still keep that money liquid. So that's an explanation on IRAs. Now let's go into something called land easements. Now if you don't know about land easements, in my opinion, they're super sketchy. And I'm not gonna go into the details and my broad explanation, I'm sure people are gonna laugh at, but essentially a land easement says that if you put in $10,000, you get $50,000 or $60,000 or $40,000 worth of write-offs. So if you put in $100,000, you could get $500,000 worth of write-offs. Now, right off the bat, red flag should go up. This sounds too good to be true. And in my opinion, it does. And that's why I personally have not used land easements. Now, not just because a red flag goes up, but because I've done research and I found a lot of people end up in audits because of it. Now, their argument is, oh, a land easement is something where you give land to the government and that's why they like it. That's why it's okay for you to get away with. But here's the deal, if you're giving land to the government, but valuing it at five times what you bought it for, that's just sketchy. Now they have all these different ways that they use some crazy accounting to prove that the value would have been more if they had developed the land and that's how they get away with it. But in my opinion, this is something that I personally have avoided. Now, lots of people have used it. Donald Trump has used it. Lots of other multimillionaires have used this strategy because they're willing to take on the risk and they believe they're in line with it being a proper tax strategy. However, for me, one, I don't think it sounds fair. Like to me, it just sounds like cheating the government. Um, especially the more that I looked into it. It doesn't mean you can't get away with it and it doesn't mean that some people don't get through audits. As I did my research, multiple people have gotten through audits and so that's why this is one of those that I personally have chosen to stay away from because I don't wanna end up in an audit for five years and then be told, hey, you actually owe you know however much money back. That's my personal decision and this is one of the examples of a tax strategy that is out there that I have stayed away from because the risk isn't worth it for me. However, maybe it is for you. I'm just telling you, do your research and follow those questions that I've given you. And at the end of the day, there's also, and I hesitate to say this, but there is an integrity factor of you know, how good you feel about it. And a lot of people, they're totally fine screwing over the government and I kind of understand that. It's frustrating to pay taxes. I'm just one of those people that I, in my soul, even if I did get away with it, didn't think that I was comfortable with it. And again, I don't judge people that use it. This is my opinion, take it for what it's worth. So we've covered land easements. I wanna jump into the last couple tax strategies and these are the ones that I use because they are the best. The first one is called cost segregation. Now, when you own real estate, you have depreciation you can use against your taxable income. So if you buy a $100,000 property, it depreciates on a 28 and a half year schedule. This is as fair as fair gets. Essentially, the government says you can depreciate your property. It's awesome, and you get to take that little chunk off against any income you've made, which would be your cash flow. So after your expenses, mortgage, all that stuff has gone out, 
you would have to pay tax on your cash flow, but you can use that depreciation against that cash flow so that you don't have to pay tax on it. Now, here's the deal. If you've got a property that's cash flowing really well, if you're depreciating it on a 28 and a half year schedule, usually that isn't going to be enough to cover everything on your cash flow. So you might still have to pay a little tax and that's taxed as ordinary income. That's why I use something called cost segregation. Now what cost segregation is, is you have certain things in your property that aren't gonna last 28 and a half years. You're talking your fridge, you're talking washer and dryer, you're talking oven, you're talking other things carpet you can use, other different things within the property that you hire an accountant to go through and appreciate those things on a faster schedule. Now what this does is it means you can take enough depreciation to offset all of your cash flow and sometimes even more than your cash flow. Sometimes even a lot more than your cash flow if you do it correctly. Now all this is doing is saying, hey, you're gonna have to pay tax on this eventually if you ever claim a gain when you sell this property. But for right now, you don't have to pay any tax and you might even have other money that you can use against your ordinary income because the depreciation you had was greater than what your cash flow was. Now, you need to talk to your accountant about this strategy, but I love it because if I own properties that are cash flowing over $300,000 a year, I don't have to pay any money on those properties. But if you go through the questions I gave you earlier, one of the bummers about that is I'm gonna burn through my depreciation. So 10 years down the road, I may have used up the majority of my depreciation where I'm in a situation where I'm paying even more tax on what my depreciation can't cover because my cash flow is more than that. And this is why the more properties you buy, the more you can speed up depreciation, the more that you can grow, and the more you're able to get out of taxes. Now, eventually you get into this point where you're struggling to buy more properties to keep up with it, and that's why it's so cool that I also use a tax strategy called a 1031 exchange. Now, what this allows me to do is if I have a property and I've used up all the depreciation, I can sell that property and then move all of the money that I make because it's gone up in value and because I've taken all the depreciation, I can take that money out without paying tax on it and use that money to purchase another property. Now, keep in mind, if I've depreciated a good chunk of it, I have to carry that depreciation, but if I go from owning a $500,000 property to a $1.5 million property, now I have a whole other million dollars worth of depreciation that I can use without ever paying taxes on all of the gains I took from that property. So essentially for my entire life on all of the money I make on real estate, the government has provided me with a way to make money through appreciation, through cash flow, and do it without ever paying taxes as long as I continue to use these strategies and buy more and more real estate while using them. Now guys, I know I haven't covered all of the tax strategies out there, but I hope that these questions will help you determine which tax strategies are going to be good for you and which ones are going to be bad. And I hope that this gives you real incentive to start investing in real estate because as you invest in real estate, you are able to create a huge passive income and you don't have to pay tax on that passive income if you use these strategies that have been proven, that have been through audits, and that are going to put you in a place where you can continue to amass wealth through passive income through real estate without paying tax. Now, if you guys enjoyed this video, please push the like button, subscribe to the channel, hit the little bell. I know this video went deeper than most videos that I do. So if you didn't enjoy it, let me know in the comments. If you did, let me know as well, and I'll do more videos like this in the future. Thanks so much, guys. Have a great day.